I want to start with a quick quiz. Who can tell me which song these chords are from? Any answers? Journey, Don't Stop Believing, exactly. That is one correct answer, but there are actually a few other answers you could have given. Um, this is one. Forever young, I want to be forever young. For instance, or you could have said... Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Or maybe, can you feel the love tonight? So as you probably noticed, they all fit together quite well. And the reason is, they all use the same four chords, these ones. And if you find that surprising, you should know that that's far from the end of it. These same four chords are used in every single one of these songs. There's actually a fantastic video by the Axis of Awesome where they do a medley of every single one of these, and it's well worth a watch. So how are people getting away with this? How are songwriters everywhere apparently copying each other without being sued? And the answer lies in that word, copying, because copying is incredibly important in art. This doesn't just apply to chords. The same melodies, the same harmonies are used across the entirety of music. Composers copy each other, sometimes consciously, but much more often subconsciously. The philosopher Cyril Jode put it well when he said, creativity is knowing how to hide your sources. <laughs> Now, my favorite model of creativity I read recently in a post by the author Jonathan Gottschall, and it's that creativity is immersion, assimilation, and recombination. Great artists immerse themselves in a huge amount of art. They assimilate the features of those, that, are, that art, and they recombine those features in novel ways to produce something new. I think this is a great model because it explains a lot about art. It explains why artistic styles evolve gradually as artists recombine each other's ideas. It explains why the best artists are often the words who work hardest to assimilate and recombine. And ultimately, it explains why things like those four chords appear all over the place. They keep coming back. But the thing about this model that I find really interesting is that none of these steps is necessarily limited to humans. Artificial intelligence has been in the news a lot recently as it learns to do things that we once thought were uniquely human, like driving cars or trading stocks. But ask most people in the street today, and they will tell you that machines can't be creative. But why should that be the case if this is how creativity works? Machines can immerse themselves in huge bodies of data. They can assimilate the features of that data and make sense of it. They can take inputs and recombine them in novel ways. They can do every step of this process. So if that's the case, why aren't there creative machines? Why aren't there AI poets, AI chefs, AI artists? And the answer, of course, is that there are. This is a poem published in a literary journal in 2011. What the publishers didn't know when they published it was that it was actually written by an artificial intelligence created by Zach Scholl, an undergrad at Duke University. There's actually a whole TED talk entitled Can a Computer Write Poetry, which is well worth a watch. But the answer, as you can see, is essentially yes. Or consider this list of ingredients for a Spanish almond crescent. This wasn't put together by a human, but was actually made by IBM supercomputer Watson. What they did was they showed Watson tens of thousands of recipes. They added in scientific data from studies about what we find pleasurable at the molecular level. And they then told it to come up with its own list of ingredients. And this is the kind of thing that it came up with. They essentially taught it to cook, to come up with new recipes. Uh, the result is Chef Watson. There's actually an entire cookbook uh, that I thoroughly recommend <laughs> having a browse of. Or consider this work of art. This wasn't painted by a human, but actually by Aaron, a program made by Harold Cohen, a US professor and artist. What he's done is, since 1973, he's been teaching Aaron, technique by technique, how to paint. And this is the kind of thing that it comes up with. Or have a listen to this piece of music.
So that was composed by the software that we're building at Duke Deck. And the model of artificial intelligence that we're using is called an artificial neural network. And this is actually being used by a lot of companies at the moment, loads of companies, and is, I think, the most promising model of artificial intelligence we have. And I just quickly wanted to explain briefly how it works. Essentially, let's say you want to teach a computer to take an image and tell you if there's a face in it. What you do is you set up uh, a series of connected nodes. You then, uh, this, this actually represents the neurons and synapses in the brain. You then give those nodes, that network, an input, in this case, an image, and that sets off a chain reaction along the synapses that at the other end give you an output, in this case, yes or no, does it contain a face? Now, the first time you do this, it doesn't have a hope. It's essentially random. It doesn't know anything yet. But if you tell it whether or not it was right, it can go back over those connections, reweight them, and try again, trying to get to a more correct answer. If you do this enough times, it gradually learns to take an image of a face, take an image, any image, and tell you if there is a face in it. In the same way, you can teach a network to take the beginning of a piece of music and tell you what it thinks should come next. And at this point, it starts to be able to write its own music. And neural networks are also what's being used by AlphaGo. AlphaGo has been in the news a lot recently. You may have seen it. It's Google DeepMind's program. It's an artificially intelligent Go playing machine that actually just beat the world's best Go player four games to one. Now, is playing Go creative? Well, yes, when you see moves like this. This is move 37 of game two. And it's been described by other Go players as beautiful. It was so beautiful and so unexpected that Lee C. Doll, who was playing the game, had to get up and leave the room when it was played. It was just an incredible move. Um, AlphaGo went on to win the game and the match, the first time that this has been done. So poems, art, recipes, music, board games, artificial intelligence is gradually mastering all of these. Are any of these full human-level creativity? No, and their makers wouldn't argue that they are, but they are the first steps towards that. There is no physical law that says that machines shouldn't be able to be as creative as people are, and we're seeing the first signs of that already. Now, will creativity in machines work in exactly the same way as it does for humans? Possibly not. We might consider their creativity fake, but I don't think that matters. I think that what's important is the effect of art. If you're played two pieces of music, one written by a human, one by a composer, and they move you in equal measure, why does it matter how they were made? What's important is the effect. As a computer sci scientist, Edsger Dijkstra, put it, the question of whether machines can think is about as relevant as the question of whether submarines can swim. What matters is the effect. And this brings me on to what I think is the crux of the matter. What will it mean for people when machines can be creative? Now, if you followed artificial intelligence in the news recently, you would have seen the main question on people's minds is, will it take people's jobs? And this is a fair question, and one that AI companies and governments, I think, need to tackle and need to answer. Because yes, AI will take some jobs. It's bound to happen. But I think that creativity is one of the spheres that is least at risk of being replaced by machines. And I think there are two reasons for this. One is that when we consume a work of art, we care about more than just the work. My favorite pianist is a guy called James Rhodes. Now, he's an incredible pianist, sure, but that's not the only reason I think he's amazing. He's overcome some huge obstacles to get where he is today. I admire him as a person. That's important to me, and that's important to any appreciation of art. We care about the story behind the art. And secondly, I think that people will always be creative. When AI can drive trucks, sure, people probably won't be driving trucks anymore. But just because I'm not the best composer in the world doesn't mean I stop writing music. In the same way, when computers writing, writing music is commonplace, I'm going to still keep composing because I love it. Machines being creative will never stop humans being creative. So I don't think there's really any reason to fear the rise of creative artificial intelligence. And in fact, I want to end by explaining why I think it'll actually be a very good thing. Firstly, and most simply, when machines can be creative, there's simply going to be more art in the world. And honestly, in my book, that can only be a good thing. But what that means is that art is going to be cheaper and more accessible for people who can't currently afford it. And this is important not just because art is nice, but because creative output is actually useful. Music is used in videos, photos are used in articles. People need creative output, but 
At the moment, most people in the world feel like they can't actually make that creative output. Creative AI is going to change this. It's going to democratize creativity. It's going to mean anyone and everyone can create their own works on their computer and use that in whatever their work is. And I think that's going to be an incredibly powerful thing. I also think that creative AI is going to change the way we consume and perceive music. At the moment, a lot of art is mass market. You will find people listening to the same songs on opposite sides of the world. Now, this wasn't always the case, and I think it's not always going to be the case. When your phone can write you a piece of music, music is going to be much more varied. It's going to be able to be personalized to you, the individual, to your surroundings. I think it's going to be an amazing thing. We're not going to have to listen to the same song. We're not all going to have to listen to that same song. It's going to be personalized. And I think that's incredibly powerful. The kings and queens of old had court musicians who would write the music specially to fit the occasion. Creative AI is actually going to open up that privilege to the rest of us. And fourthly, I think that it's going to make us more creative. Fan Hui was another Go player who played AlphaGo a bit before Lee Si Dol did. He lost as well. Um, and he had this to say after the game. I lose, I study the game, and maybe I change my game. I think it's a good thing for the future. Playing an expert artificial intelligence helps human experts to learn and understand moves that they wouldn't necessarily have thought of on their own. And I think this is going to apply to all creative disciplines. But where I think creative AI gets incredibly exciting is when you look outside the world of art, because art is not, because creativity is not just about art. Creativity is the source of ideas and the key to problem solving. IBM recently announced that they're going to use Watson to try to figure out why Italians have such high life expectancy. Google's DeepMind have said that their avowed goal is to use their tech to try to solve some of society's biggest problems. How do we solve climate change? How do we feed billions of people? How do scientists reconcile the quantum world with relativity? These are all huge questions that right now are defeating us. I think when computers can have ideas, they're going to help us in all of these questions. Countless times throughout history, today's impossible has become tomorrow's commonplace. In 1901, Wilbur Wright said to his brother, I think it'll be 50 years before humans fly. He and his brother did it just two years later. In 2014, people thought it'd be 10 years before artificial intelligence beat people at Go. DeepMind did it just one year later. Machines are getting more capable, they're getting more intelligent, and they're doing so at a quicker and quicker pace. Now, this might make a lot of you fairly uneasy, but I think Sam Harris put it well when he said, the only thing nearly as scary as building an artificial general intelligence is the prospect of not building one. There are some huge problems facing us in the world today, and we should all be striving for a world in which there are more great ideas. I think it's incredibly important to realize that creative AI isn't something to be feared, but is something that will make the world a much better and a more creative place. Thank you.